any members of our audience who do not know you, you have uh, changed the lives of millions of people with your uh, public presentations and the books that you've written about your amazing life. Can we start with the first near-death experience, what you were doing in your life as a career and how this experience changed you? Well, um, I grew up as a tough guy in South Carolina. I was a macho sports guy, you know. Uh, religion was not a big deal to me. And I was, a, uh, well, basically a jackass. And a typical Southern redneck, all the things that go with that. And then I served in the Marine Corps. And in the course of that particular period of time in history, there were many things going on in the world of adrenaline, driven individuals that became interesting uh, ways and pathways of life. And uh, we, we grew, we owned grocery stores and I would buy and sell old antique cars and restore them. And I was going on about my business. You know, I had fallen in love and um, I'm living, I think the best life in good shape and not very spiritually grounded, George. But in all those other aspects, I was really grounded, you know. And then one day in 1975, I was talking on the telephone with a friend, and I heard the, I heard the thunder. And I told Tom I had to get off the phone. And he said, he said, what, are you afraid of a little lightning? And I said, yes. Lightning came down the phone line. That was when we had phone lines, you know, telephone yeah. calls, not wireless. It followed the line down, came into the house. It went into the side of my head above my ear. It went down my spine. It welded the nails of the heels of my shoes to the floor. It threw me up in the air. I see the ceiling. It slams me back down. A ball of fire comes through the room and blinds me. I am burning. I am on fire. I am paralyzed, I cannot move, and I cannot see. Okay, so my vision came back into focus a little, but I wore welder's glasses for a year because I couldn't handle light. I was completely paralyzed for six days, partially paralyzed for seven months, and it took me two years to learn to walk and feed myself. And in the course of that, I had what is now known in 1975, as a classic near-death experience. And in the whisk of a 28-minute period when they said I was dead, because when they brought me into the emergency room, it said, patient unconscious, patient not breathing, no EKG. That pretty much covered it. I don't know about any of that stuff, George, because from the time that ambulance got there, the phone was melted. Okay, my shoes are welded to the floor because they were over the nails. I had on bass regions with nails, heels are nailed on, and they're over the nails in the floor. And that's what grounded and keeping me from blowing the smithereens. But I lifted out of my body, George, and I, I, right here at this point, I, I'd like everybody who's going through this issue of what's happening and being afraid and everybody's scared to death of death. I like to reassure everybody that what I'm telling you, you can trust to be true. And why I say this is that you know, as, as well as everybody, that I have been dead so many times, it's like a comedy routine. <laughs> okay? I mean, when you get to talking about being dead, George, I got it down pat. <laughs> okay? So, in the first one, I lift up out of my body, I was not on fire, I was not burning, I could move and I could see. And I was watching all the things that were going on, okay? They put me in an ambulance and I went with my body because I thought it was important that I stayed with it. I was completely and totally disinterested in it. That world I had just left other than Sandy, who I was in love with, other than that, nothing mattered. I had no interest in it. I didn't care about it. And I won't say I was overly materialistic, but I was materialistic. Okay, so that meant nothing. 
And I just kind of went with the body. And so I'm watching the paramedic and I'm over his shoulder. And he says, he's gone, he's gone, okay? And this is the truth. I thought, gone where? Okay, I'm still Daniel. I'm still me, okay? I'm just in my energetic body, which I never looked at or paid any attention to it. And when he said he was gone, I could feel this movement over my left shoulder and it was like a tunnel. And I started down this tunnel, but the, the way I describe it, George, it was moving whether I was moving or not. And it was like taking off layers of me, like an onion peeling away that I could tell that probably cynical, skeptical, anal retentive personality disorder, which is my <laughs> basic personality, you know, <laughs> you know, and you add jackass to that, you pretty well covered me. And you're peeling those away, you're becoming lighter, becoming more fluid, and you come to the end of the tunnel. And when I got to the end of the tunnel, I understand being in scary situations in places in my life because my life took me in places that were scary. And I'm always trying to acclimate. I look down at my right hand. Now I'm left-handed, so I still worry about why did I look at my right hand as opposed to my left hand? You know, this is kind of stuff back here you think about. It wasn't there. But as I focused in this blue, silvery, sensational place, my hand appeared. And it's like when you put your hand underwater, it looked like my fingers were longer. It wasn't like Michael Jackson's glove, but it was a shimmering essence to reinforce me that I still had a consciousness of a body that I had to be reaffirmed and reassured that wherever it was I was, I could relate to it. And I now know that that's the reason 45 years later. You know, things that when you look at this and you realize where this has taken me in my life, you do a lot of analysis and you do a lot of study, you pay attention. And as you know, after this happened, I became, when I got up to walk again, I became a hospice volunteer. And I've been a hospice volunteer for 42 years. And I have more than $34,000 at the bedside. And I've been with more than 2,000 people going from this world to the next world. And I can tell you this, that there might be people who know more about the death experience or the life experience in me. But at the bedside, there's nobody who knows more. And I've been dead four times struck by lightning, a death experience. Lightning did so much damage inside of me, open heart surgery, a near death experience. That's 13 years later, seven years later, brain surgery. And then 20 years later, open heart surgery again at 68 years old with an aneurysm under the aortic valve, near death experience. And five days, 2018, five days later, I went into cardiac arrest at two o'clock on a Sunday morning and watched them revive me. I came back into my body. I went, stayed three or four or five minutes and I went into cardiac arrest again, two times. Probably took them 20, 25 minutes, did the whole thing to resuscitate me, but flatlined. So when I cohesively look at all that, George, I have all the interactions and the knowledge of what happens in the, to a family and to the person in transition and what they need and how, and to the people who leave them, because I have watched it my entire adult life. So the most important thing, George, in that, that people can draw from the near-death experience is this. About 27% of every time you hear somebody tell you about a near-death experience, it's not true. They've either emotionally or psychologically framed it to fit some kind of paradigm in their life, drug overdose, some something, that they can use that name and that term to brand their reality, okay? But the rest of those are people who have a deep mystical spiritual experiences. Let's go so, back to your first one. So your I'm first gonna, one, your, 
I'm okay. going right there now. Okay. Okay. So I get to the end of the tunnel. I look at my hand. My hand disappears. When I take my focus, because I can feel something moving toward me, I take my focus off my hand, George, and it disappeared before I quit looking at it. It went back into the mist. I turn to my right, my left. There's a being, a being that had form and shape, was, you can't say vibrating, but it was emanating an energetic pattern. You know, I'm watching it. And then I had what I think is absolutely the single most important thing about the near-death experience. And this is something that I have studied for 43 years, a panoramic life review, the Hall of Records, the Book of Judgment, all those things that you hear. I saw my entire, entire life pass before me in a 360 degree panorama. I had missed nothing. You know how many hairs was in the nose of the doctor who pulled you from your mother. You know everything that there is. From the time you opened your eyes, you have complete cognitive awareness. No doubt about it. And it's all happening at the same time. No doubt about it. Then you watch the same life from a second person point of view as if you were your own best friend. So you can see how silly, how funny, how dumb, how stupid it was, but it's from your best friend. You know, they, you know there's no judgments, just look it. And then you literally become every person that you ever encounter. And you feel the direct results of your interaction between you and that person. So no one gets away with anyone, anything. And you are responsible for the intention of why you did what you did. And you're not going to rationalize it. You're going to become them. And then this question comes, and I have to use a Danianism because it's, it, it's too hard to explain. But this question comes, and I'll say, God, if God couldn't come today and God sent you in the life you just reviewed, what difference did you and God make? You judge you. Nobody knows more about you than you. But the person, the being that is witnessing this event is a far greater, more expansive, wondrous spiritual being than the human being you interacted with mm -hmm. as you lived in this physical life. Once that was over, and... I didn't have a lot of really good stuff, George, you know, <laughs> when I had to look at my life, golly, and even from a second person point of view, when I was a bully, tough guy, you know, intimidating and, you know, all the things that we as, a, as young guys, especially rednecks, all the kind of personality traits that comes with that I had a legendary overhand left and a really good right uppercut. So my fights lasted maybe three minutes, okay? But I would. So that arrogant kind of place. So I couldn't figure out much of what me and the divine had ever done, except maybe a couple of times uh, helped a dog or something like that. But mostly it was the agony, anguish, and the, the in, in, inadequate value I put in people to affect their ego and their self-recognition and appreciation of themselves. So I decided to dedicate my life to quit being that. I have never quite been successful at it yet, but I'm still trying. Um, when you have that first one and you're floating out of your body looking at it, are you wondering, where the hell am I? What's going on here or not really? No, no. you know the system. As I look back now, you know the system. There is a conscious part of you that is aware of this process. There is not a, I don't know where I am, or Lord, I'm scared, or maybe this and maybe that, the very moment you separate, every, every attachment that you had to other than love has no value. And I, always, I came up with the saying, I, I said, listen, everybody, you have never seen a U-Haul on the back of a hearse. The only, where that, the only place that ever happens was in Egypt <laughs> when they <laughs> buried you with everything and three or four wives and all your integrals in jars. But I've never, you know, there is nothing about this dimension or this level of consciousness that, that, that has any value the moment you lift out. As you are recovering, all those months recovering, 
trying to be able to walk again and everything, it gives you time to reflect. Is that when you sort of decided, I'm going to make a change? Well, once you realize two things, well, three things. Once you realize that you are a spiritual being, and I term it this, a great, powerful, and mighty spiritual being with dig dignity, direction, and purpose. That's who you are. I have never been able to doubt that in my four journeys and the things that I have witnessed at the bedside of, of people going from this world to the next, okay? I, the things that I have seen, 34,000 hours, a lot of two or three o'clock in the morning and what happens that has ever not reinforced that. Second, if I didn't go to hell in the last four journeys, nobody's going to hell, okay? <laughs> So when you learn you don't die, when you learn you're a spiritual being and you're not going to go to hell, that's enough to inspire you to change, not to be threatened to change. My heart goes out, George, in this insanity that we're living in. All those people who have lost somebody or is in fear of losing their own life or in fear of causing someone they love's death by being close to them. My heart goes out to them, but they have to know this. this. This life is just a part of your life. And it's a part of who you are. And it's something that you chose to do. And it was something that you were chosen to do with the emphasis on being chosen. I mean, these are the rules. I, you know, I, I, I look at websites and things about people who have in their brilliant psych, psychological nature and their brilliant physics have come to the conclusion that you don't have a soul. Well, those people, people, George, are basically silly. I look at them with a sense of humor, you know, because first, I say that you not only, uh, I don't know the term or what soul means, but I can tell you unequivocally you're a spiritual being, and I can tell you unequivocally you will lift out of your body, you will have a life with you. And what I did is, you know, the saying in my, in my house there, in my father's house, there are many mansions and I go to prepare a place for you. Well, after I had this panoramic life with you and I had a moment to reflect on it, this being and I, we went to this, I called it a crystal city. You know, you try to find words, George, to describe something that there's no words in English that describe it, but you have to try to give people an understanding of the experience. I went to this crystal city and as I went to enter it, the being who had come to guide me merged with me, okay? It merged, I, I and it became the same. Now I've worried about that and I've listened to a thousand, well, probably 400 near death experiences, real ones from the old days, okay? From the old days and when that being merged with me, I had a heightened sense of me. I mean, I was more aware of I was less the Danian who left South Carolina and more aware of the Danian as the being, the spiritual being, than I was even through the near-death experience, even through the panoramic life of me. And I came to this place and it was amazing to me because it looked like it was built of light. And it had a, a, a nuclei, like you look at atoms and you see that nuclei. But it, it was just the, the arcs and the waves and the, the movement of it. And then these 12 beings appear. And there was a 13th being to the right, just above the, the 12 in front of me. And it would designate one of the beings, not in order. And then all of a sudden, that being would resonate colors, emanating colors, and it would resonate to where it was the only thing I saw. And then it was all, and I'd have to say like a laptop, it was like a box of knowledge, which is what I called them, came and it would open up and I would see these series of events, okay? And it was like I could smell them. It was like I was physically being aware of them, although I am not physical anymore. And then that one would go. 
And when I used to laugh and tell jokes in the lectures, you know, I used to tell people, maybe I died and went to the radio shack, you know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> because when you try to think about it, but I went through 12 of these boxes. I never did quite understand in the first couple of years what that was, but it was burned into me. And it was burned into me as, as I was always thought it George, was going to be a guidepost for something that would be shown me. And when I saw the, what I thought were these events, that these events would allow me to see markers. And I knew there was a destiny being designed for me. I just didn't know what it was. I knew that I had agreed to it. And I knew that I was chosen for it. That's the same thing everybody that's watching this got here. And it's the same thing you're doing here. And it's the same structure that I'm describing. No doubt about it. Not maybe. No doubt about it. Okay, so as I, all of a sudden, I am floating above my body covered in a sheet in a room because it had been busy at the hospital. I know the details because my brother was there, my father was there, Sandy was there, the guy on the other end of the phone, Tommy was there, and his wife at that time, Alice, was there. They were all there. My father, they're all there. So listening to all their stories about what happened, George, is how I understand. The one that I could never put together was my father's description of saying, seeing me on a slab. I could never find that place, you know? And then I had some Danian debunker, and he was a doctor from our little Southern fundamentalist Baptist town who said that he had come to see me and that I was awake and he, it's just like up on the internet. And I could never find anybody. I could never find anybody who ever remembered see him. And the doctor on duty never found him. And then I went to him and he had no record of a file because I haven't seen him since I was like nine years old. You know, he's a little local doctor. But as I piece it all together, Tommy had come into the room and I could feel him coming down the hallway, George. And I could feel that we had been friends all our lives. And he was a corpsman in the Navy. So he knew the lingo. He knew what to do. That's what kept me at least kept air in my lungs and he kept you know doing what he was doing and sandy and i could feel that sense of loss and grief and that's when i started to understand bereavement loss grief and pain and the sense of being loved you know and it's a guy so it has to be in a love that's about appreciation honoring the friendship you know and all of a sudden, I'm back in my body. It is burning. It's on fire. I can barely see. I mean, everything, all the lights are burning my eyes. And I realize I was not breathing. I mean, I am in the body, alive, not breathing. And I had to fight to take a breath. And I took a breath and I blew on the sheet. Tommy saw the sheet blowing. And he went and yelled for the doctors. They came in, they took me back, they stabilized me. And I spent the next two years learning to walk and feed myself and destroying probably one of the greatest relationships I ever had because of the struggle and the pain and the, the hardship I was putting her through. And when people talk about grieving, George, if you think about me saying I've been dead three or four times, think about what I have done to my family and people who have loved me. Like in 2018, when they all came here to say goodbye because no one thought I would make it. So my brother and my sister for the third time came to tell me goodbye. And uh, Catherine, say goodbye. So I understand from a, a spiritual, emotional point of view what people are going through. But why I do these talks, George, is because nobody dies. It never happens. It's not a part of the nature of reality. It's not. And I say that from 
tens of thousands of hours. Knowing what people go through, you have loss, you have bereavement, you have abandonment, and then you have grief. I designed my life to keep people from getting to grief. I created the Twilight Brigade, one of the largest end of life care volunteer programs for dying veterans in American history. And I've died with more veterans than anybody else, anywhere, anytime as a volunteer. Why? I served in the Marine Corps, simplified Dallas Ever Faithful. I know what they go through. I know what combat does. I understand the mindset and I've created and structured programs that would allow a person to frame the issues to help a person see the value of their life, celebrate their love, and go from this world to the next. That was number one. About the Twilight Brigade in detail, but uh, back to your journey. So you write a, a series of books. I think they've been read by millions of people. They've helped change people's lives. But along the way, you've been bashed by both sides. On one hand, science will say, near-death experiences, the tunnel, the light, all that stuff, that's just the brain dying. Nothing happens. When you're dead, you're dead. On the other hand, religion, which has always taught us about we are spiritual beings, but we go to heaven or hell, they're not really comfortable with near-death experiences, I don't believe, either. Um, talk about that struggle, you know, where you find yourself kind of in the middle of the two and how you've dealt with it. Well, a lot of us have mystical things happen to us. A lot of us have what you call divine interventions, okay? For me, and you know, I went on about my business. I went on about my life. I, I changed so much about me, George, because I could no longer face the fact that I was responsible for the personality that I basically have, but that my intention was for the wrong reason. Everybody has to understand, it's never what you do that matters. It's why you do it that matters. So you have to change, I had to change why, which begins to shift and change your life. I would come and help Raymond when Dr. Raymond Moody, who wrote Life After Life, who coined the term near-death experience, he lived in Augusta, Georgia, 12 miles from me, and he was going to medical school in the hospital they brought me into. So star athlete, dies in the hospital, comes back to life. He read this article, and so he tracked me down. And he had a program, this is like a 77. He had a program, and I went to it, and we became fast friends. But I was processing this, George. You know, you can't go from where I was to where I had become and the reality of what had happened to me and me not be able to talk myself out of it. No one was trying harder than me for it not to be true. I promise you that. Because I alienated everybody. And I alienated them in such a way because they, they would rather have that jackass back, the Daniel or Danny that they knew, than this one that, that was emerging. This one, you know, when you want to know if somebody had a near-death experience, George, the first thing you ask them is, what did they do for the next six months of their life? And if you listen to that, you'll know if they're telling you, I won't say lie, if they're telling you the truth or not. Well, I read Bibles, books of the dead, okay? Raymond's book was just coming out, and when I read the galleys of that book. I knew Raymond was cool. I didn't talk to anybody. I told a couple of people the stories because Sandy was there, Tommy was there, my dad was there. They didn't buy into it. Huh. Okay, this is 1976, 77. So when I watched Raymond through the years, George, I watched Raymond. And Raymond was not equipped to handle the onslaught of negative press power and humiliation. Since I'm nobody and you can't hurt my feelings, all you can do is make me mad. <laughs> I don't have that you can hurt my feelings. You know, I, I'm not like that. I don't have that way about me. I, don't, I 
I don't give a damn, but I care. So I watched Raymond and I watched this destroy his life. A near-death experience literally destroys basically the life of the person who had it. When people say, I wish I had a near-death experience, that makes you crazy. Yeah. Okay? Be glad that it's, you got me telling it to you, and I'm telling you the truth. I don't have to paint anything. You know me, George. You know exactly how I am. You know, we've been on a lot of shows together and coast to coast. And, you know, I, I appreciate people's opinions, George. But I am not a really uh, learned person. But you don't know how many times you have to kill me before I get to be a really curious individual. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, and I studied every religious context and every book and old Roberts and everybody and Billy Graham and looking at, I was into the Egyptian Book of the Dead and the Popo Vial for the Maya and the Aztec calendar and all this stuff. And I want to tell you something that I don't want to talk about in this show, but I want to tell you something. I never talked about this, but as I would crawl out of the bed, I had to roll and hit the floor. And I had to crawl to get in my rocking chair and I, I would work my feet to get my legs to work and I would rock. Because I had days, George, when I would get out the door, I would fall and hit the wall, pass out, wake up, blood everywhere, ants in my nose and in my eyes, and I can't move. And this goes on for hours till somebody comes by. Another time, I go out to look in my van, I put my hand on the van, I push the door knob, and I black out, and I hang, pull my shoulder out of socket, and I hang there for three hours, screaming until my dad got there coming by because somebody called. So to crawl and get in my rocket chair. In those first couple of weeks, George, I would go to these levels. I did not function here. I was not here. My body was here, but I wasn't. And I would travel through these levels of consciousness. And every so often, I, I, I now look at it and they're just showing me stuff, you know, because I could not live inside of myself in South Carolina in 1975 with the spiritual religious issues that people deal with and the medical establishment disavowing reality. I would have blown up, okay? Or I would have done some damage. But I never knew what these beings were, George, and I'd like to explore it sometime with you. And I was talking to Catherine and I decided to tell her, we were sitting on the porch one evening and we saw this zigzag in the sky and we, we couldn't figure out what it was in, in Vegas. And I started to tell her and she told me that these beings that I saw in the fir after the first near death experience, these beings I saw were insectoids. Okay, I don't know what insectoid is, George. You know, <laughs> the thing I care about a UFO is if they want to poke me and feel me and punch <laughs> me, stick their fingers in some orifice. <laughs> Just let me drive. I am a NASCAR man. Show me the steering wheel. Show me the gas pedal. Tell me how many miles per gallon this turkey gets and let me take it around the moon and back. <laughs> if you know some aliens and they need to poke and probe, I'm their man. All right, so... Catherine started telling me what this all was, the insectoids, and I look up all that. I have not seen them since those early days, George, okay, 1975. But after this open heart surgery, I saw them again. And what was so interesting about them, because this is after the surgery, because I had to go back in the hospital two or three times, and no, I, I'm a, uh, I was down to 12% heart function. You know, and I'm living at 18%, and I'm on oxygen and all the stuff waiting on me to die. Okay. And I saw him again. And this time, George, they were dressed up. <laughs> you know, they had on their little robes and they had on their little <laughs> breastplates, you know. Okay. You know, they, had, they were like dressing up for me. Okay. You know, and this is how I saw it. 
from the first ones I've saw to the next time, but I saw them and I passed through that in that era. And that's just something I wanted to put in because I look at this UFO story. I, I cannot not believe that there are extraterrestrial life because the sheer numbers of what the satellites and the, the Galileo and the Hubble and the, that Spanish satellite, when you photograph the universe, George, there is no way that with 10 trillion planets and stars, we're the only ones here. That becomes a stupid thought, stupid, okay? I know that there are dimensional existences. I know right here, right now, less than a breath away, and the time that you breathe in, let hold on and breathe out, another world is that close. When you breathe in, pay attention to when you breathe in and when you breathe out, in order to breathe out, you would have to stop breathing in and then breathe out. So in that space right there is where everything happens. And that's as far as away as you are from that dimension. Let me ask you this. You, you've you've uh, withstood so many attacks, debunker, debunkers go after you, skeptics and things of that sort. Are you at all encouraged by sort of the research into consciousness, how much more willing scientists and uh, academics are to look at it? Because it's kind of a big mixing pot of things like near-death experiences, UFO experiences. Uh, the willingness to investigate consciousness is a, is a road to both of those, don't you think? Absolutely. And you know what? I take pride in that I, I helped start it. Remember, I was with Raymond Moody from the very beginning. From the very beginning. Okay. Now, come 13 years later, I'm going on about my life, George. I'm studying. I'm learning. I got it. As soon as I could get up, I volunteered as a hospice volunteer. Because if God couldn't come today and God sent me and the life I was going to review, I was going to make the difference in the lives of those who was going to that level of consciousness next. And I had already been there. I know the way. You can't tell me nothing. I don't care what you think. I will win this argument. <laughs> Good luck to whoever thinks they think there's no such thing as a life after this. That is a silly, nonsensical, illogical being in the story. So I watched it drive Raymond crazy. But here we are in 1989. Open heart surgery. I get pericarditis from a cut on my hand from putting a, I had a Volvo from like 1942. And I always rebuilt cars because it kept me from thinking and I would sell them and I'd make money. Okay, so I've owned 55 cars, rolls is everything, but it was always to fix them and to sell them. So here we are. I have to go in for open heart surgery. I'm down in Charleston. You lost your sound. Oh, there it is. Are you back? Here? There you are. Yeah. Okay. I'm lying on the couch, George, in Charleston, and I'm sweating. True story. And I finally decide I'm going to go to the hospital, which was just across the street. I get there. And because I didn't have insurance, because I'd already lost everything I ever had because of what I was going through. And God knows the pain and the blacking out and the, just the, my back and all that. Oh, my God. People have no idea. So. Here I go and I walk in there. I think I have the flu. All right. The little guy comes in. He looked like Doogie Howser, George. He's got the little glasses on. Here. He's got these little glasses on. He, he looks like he's like 12 years old. Okay. And so I'm like 30. I'm 38 years old. I don't drink, do drugs, none of that stuff. Okay. That lightning broke me a lot of that habit. Okay. <laughs> so, so he, Put his little, put his little stethoscope to my chest. And he, his eyes got big and he turns around and walked away. Pretty fast. The last thing I remember was him and a crash car. 
That's the last thing I remember. The people with the little green feeties on, the little green hat, the little green outfit coming at me. And I black out. I wake up and they're shaving me. And the doctor came in and he said, and my dad came in and I'm 38 years old. And God knows, George. And they told me they had to do open heart surgery and that I would be dead in less than 45 minutes. Okay. If I had, they had not, if I hadn't come into the hospital. So my dad says, he says, well, what do you want to do? I said, dad, <laughs> I am out of here. That's enough of this, okay? Yeah, I don't want to have no open heart surgery. I don't want to hear about it. And I said, Dad, did you see the size of the hands on that guy that's going to be in my chest? I said, did you see the size of his hands? I said, you can forget it. My dad, he couldn't handle it, but he knows how I am about it. You know, I'm a hospice volunteer. I go to the nursing homes. You know, I'm not that person. And I said, I don't want to have that. You can forget it. You know what my dad did? He called Raymond and flew Raymond over, okay? So Raymond came in and he's just to talk. You know, come on, Dan, you gotta stay. Come on, cause I wasn't doing it. I'm out of here. I'll see you turkeys later. <laughs> you know, I'm out of here. And finally he said, please stay and help me. Stay and help me. So I said, okay. I watched the open heart surgery. I can describe the concept, what went on. I even the bets of who would I would who would make it and whether I would or not, and even saw the guys and I talked to them about it. All this is reality, George. This is not some hyperbole. This is how it happened. And I could witness it. I was pretty amazed because I always thought in surgery, it was like Dr. What was that? Uh, Hildare. Wow. Yeah, one. Yeah, like Dr. Kildare, you know, they were in there talking about sex and well, who did what. And they're listening to uh, they're listening to Purple Hay. I mean, listen to uh, Poco Harem. <laughs> OK, and they're going at it. OK, and then I'm back down the tunnel. I didn't see the being of light, although I was aware of the being's presence. I didn't see him. It was not the same as the first. It was as though I had acclimated and I didn't go there in pain. I didn't go, I didn't come from pain or suffering or any of that. And then I had that second panoramic life review. It was the worst thing about a panoramic life review, George. It starts over from the beginning. Does it pick up where you left off? Okay. Oh, no. There is no escape from you facing you. You can forget <laughs> it. It's not going to happen. And you are responsible for, for why, not what. If why I kill someone to protect my wife and children, I'm going to be punished for that? No way. What is my intention? But tell, I'm me about the, tell me about the Twilight Brigade. Um, let me, let you me started. Let me, because that's okay. the third okay. one. Wait a minute, George. That's the third one. Oh, right. Okay, the Twilight Brigade came out in 1997 when I had to have brain surgery. Okay, when I had to have brain surgery, I'm still at number two. I need people to listen to this and ever how you edit this to listen to it that I'm telling you the truth. Okay, this is one person's experience. It's one person's experience, and in the in the time where everybody's scared to death of death, let me tell you what happens based on my own experience. My own experience and watching thousands of people go from this world to the next. So I go to this, this, not to the city of light. I go to this place where light is healing and frequencies and the healing modalities was energetic and frequencies. And it was showing me how things operate in this reality and in the levels of how we function. And it was to educate me about the nature of the physical being as an electrical entity. Now think of how crazy that is for me to be able to see. So I come back. I go to Raymond's. 
I go to Raymond's. I come out of that open heart surgery. It's another nine months of cutting your chest open and the damage inside of me, George, inside of me, I look horrible. There's so much scar tissue in there. You know, my heart, okay, all that, all on the left side, you know, my back in the, is, you know, just, I'm sorry, but that's where it is. So I go to see Raymond. Raymond's sitting in the house with no electricity and no water on, on Christmas Eve by himself. And he was broken. His world of coming as a, someone that's never had the experience, who brought it forth, his own people had beaten him. The doctors and the, the psychologist and the physicist and all that. So I cut the electricity on and I took him out to dinner. We got the water turned on before Christmas Eve ended. We got it all done and he ate, probably hadn't eaten in a day. And we ate and we sat around and that was the moment that I decided that everybody needed to pick on somebody their own size. And I decided that that was me. You wanna come argue with me about whether there's life after death? Kiss my ass. Come get you some. <laughs> I've spent my whole life in death, George. I have yeah. I don't care who you are, what you think. You will lose this argument. There is a life after death. And not only that, no one dies. To think that you're going to die is nuts. All right. So I wrote Saved by the Light. I got with, I was, with Raymond and I created experiments. We worked on programs. <laughs> and I came and I, I met the publisher and I wrote Saved by the Light. And I put the boxes of knowledge in Saved by the Light, which turned out to be future events. This is, I call that part Nostradamian <laughs> because I don't, I don't buy into half the stuff I hear, George. You know, I have to live in the Swami business, but that's because I can fund the Twilight Brigade. Okay, so I don't believe all that, but I put the boxes of knowledge. And that was 1993, published in 1994. In 1997, at the height and fame of the great Daniel, king of death, I blow five subdual hematomas in my brain. And I have to have brain surgery. So I had to do it because the pain was so horrible and so pressing. And the, whatever it was pushing on my spine that was driving those nerves in my lower back, I could not take it. I either had to die or I had to have something done. Well, in the third one, George, I was standing at the end of the bed. I was not above it like the first two. I was standing at the end of the bed. I watched them roll my head over. I watched them shave my head. And I watched them start drilling holes in my head. And I moved into the place that I always describe where people are floating above, which I call that the transition place, the place where you acclimate from leaving the physical, becoming ethereal, and from ethereal becoming spiritual or spirit, in spirit, okay? But this time I realized that this place was a level of consciousness that I never saw in the first two, okay? So I get down the tunnel. George, I already know the panoramic life of you, so I go through probably a third of it, the worst part. But I was so drawn back to that place that was a level of consciousness, because look, I've been at death and dying now, what, 20 years? I've been already dead again, okay? So it's nothing new to me, all right? But I saw this place where people can get trapped. 
is people become obsessive, compulsive, and narcissistic, and controlling, and manipulating, and alcoholism, and all those places. Um, when you come into this place as a physical being, you are given free will. It's a part of the nature of what this life is about. There is free will, and you don't have to go anywhere. You can stay there. You can't stay there forever. But you understand, I didn't know where ghosts came from. I never knew where ghosts came from, and I didn't care. You know, I never seen a ghost, okay? But then I knew where ghosts came from. I knew where possessions come from, where attachments come from, depending on what phase of the month is or what year it is, based on whichever calendar explores that ancient religious contextual uh, nature relationship. But I saw so many veterans, so many soldiers, and so many people, so many of people abused and would not allow themselves to go to the light. And when I got up from the dead that time, I built the Twilight Brigade because I was not, I'd been going with veterans and visiting veterans, but it was not an organization because by then, George, I had figured out how you did it. I'm 22, three years later. And so I know what to do. People need to know their life has value. And they need to know that they made a difference in your life. And the fact that you're there to see them means that what you're saying is true. You cannot lie to somebody in transition because in transition, you are not fully conscious here. You, are, you begin to make the transition no matter what because you have an appointed time with destiny. You came to breathe X amount of breaths. And in that X amount of breaths, you set a series of goals for yourself. And you will, very few people ever say, ever, ever fail. Many of us sell out because that nature of when an intention becomes a motive is the spiritual trap that you take on. So I built the Twilight Brigade. It became one of the largest end-of-life care volunteer programs for dying veterans. It, it, I, spent 20, I spent 37 years in the VA dying with veterans, 37 years, 34,000 hours. But I, I built an organization that birthed what is now called the No Vet Die Alone program, which is institutional wise in the VA. And I am a member of the No Vet Die Alone advisory board to, and I help co-write the standard end of life care model for the Veterans Administration. Well, with a lot of other people. But so my dreams live on in the lives of dying veterans. My biggest crisis right now, George, is I cannot get to my boys. I know what it's like to be a veteran and to be dying. And I think that where we are in our lives right now, everybody, where we are in our lives is a test of our real, true, moral nature. What has value. So for me, as Daniel Brinkley and, and understand that nobody dies. Nobody. And to think that is some absurd concept that a spiritual being could possibly conceive of dying is insane. That's insane. And that when you take a deep breath, and I, I think there is evil afoot and deception is afoot because I saw it as a box of knowledge. Anybody who reads Saved by the Light, chapter five, box 12, the book I wrote, 26 years ago, published in 1994, and the final vision, and cut on the news. I have said for 45 years that the battle for the souls of humankind would be fought in healthcare. So I took myself to healthcare, palliative and end of life. Why? I know everything about it, from sitting at the bedside to being the person doing it to my family, then watching me die and the agony of what they've had to witness and go through, and how much I've destroyed of their lives trying to survive in this one. You know, I don't have no problems about it. It's a price I was willing to pay. But the title of chapter box 12, George, is Technology and the Virus. Oh. Yeah, I, I read it a long time ago, so I'm gonna go, I've got a copy right here. I'm going to go get it. And then read the final vision. And when it starts to talk about refugees flooding over the border and having to put military 
on the border, that would tell the timing of when it is to execute the next step. Okay, so I wrote this 25 years ago and it happened to me 45 years ago when I was dead, <laughs> okay? So, you know, people can puff and talk and sell wolf tickets and they can do some equations and come up with all kinds of theories about what they believe and why they don't believe. But I wrote 25 years or 26 years ago with Paul Perry, a vision I had of a box of knowledge that I described when I was dead in September the 17th in 1975. And I have lived my entire life based on the battle for the souls of humankind. And I took the fight to them. I took the fight to them. So is there a life after death? Absolutely. Do you die? That is impossible. It cannot happen. There is no possible way. Are you going to hell? I don't, I looked up halos, the Greek word, the, the words in the Bible, the eight times it's used in the Bible. I just can't figure out how in the world, based on all the religious dogma that describes going to hell, I have never been there, okay? I have seen a place where people trap themselves and that could be the, the, the emptying of the gulp, you know, the whole thing about the well of souls and all of that in Revelations. I'm a pretty good thumper. You can't kill me and think I don't search spirituality. I know I don't look at it now and what I don't, I read and how I try to understand because People need to not be afraid of something that does not happen. And they can't let the fear of their love be a weapon. So I think the devil or the Luciferian Sabbateans for this two things. As I watch this game they're playing, it's a 1968 playbook in politics. It's 1968. That means they would use racism. And I, as a 70-year-old Southerner who grew up in segregation, my pride that I owe the devil, our Luciferians, is that we are not a racist nation. We have grown to the point where you cannot incite us Americans, not just white people, but us. You cannot incite us because we are not racist okay i take the greatest joy in that pride that my country has grown to that place in herself as she's evolving right and to know that if i saw it 45 years ago and i've designed my entire life around it and i wrote about it 25 years ago and you can read it and see it today, the virus and technology, the technology and the virus. And you can look through those boxes. Some I've never seen. Some I've never seen. And maybe, George, because of how I was looking at it, because when Paul and I was writing it, and I thank Paul Perry for a lot of the words we used, when we were writing it, maybe how I was looking at it, because I wanted to write it in 1975 terms, I was writing Saved by the Light. Okay, Saved by the Light was what happened and I didn't want to bring it up to date. I'm a lot smarter now about what I wrote in 1975, but it was it, about 1975, I'm a lot smarter, okay? But to know now as I look at it, that people need to pay attention to their health care and the quality of taking care of themselves because the true spiritual test is how well you take care of yourself in a routine perspective every day. And instead of realizing that uh, this stuff is basically not true. So the other thing I wanna thank the Luciferians for <laughs> is this. If my mother and my father were alive, which they are not, and I passed with both of them, if they were alive, is what I know about hospice. There is nothing you could do to stop me from getting to them. There is nothing. So based on my new self, it's just how many times I have to make bail. <laughs> but based on my old self, I thin the ranks pretty quick. 
no one will stop me from getting to the bedside of my mother and my father. And you better figure out a way for me to be able to do it. Because I draw the line in the sand and I'm fighting right now to get to my veterans. And I study and look at those vaccines and I'm not the kind of person, George, that casually listens to a vaccine that's a gene therapy. I don't listen to that. I read every word, look it up in the dictionary, go to the CDC website. This is what I have been doing for 42 years. 42 years, I've been looking up illnesses and diseases and actions and how to advise a family. I mean, I've been doing this normally. It didn't just start like in the last week. I've been doing this my whole life. I know the deal. So to put it in a, a tight package, everybody, George Knapp is an absolutely fabulous, magnificent human being with a sense of curiosity because we live in a, a state that has so much groundable knowledge about extraterrestrial existences. Only someone who is able to blind themselves from the truth <laughs> would not be researching it as a good journalist, a good investigative journalist. That's a fact. And I've known George for like 25 years. And number two, you will not die. It will never happen. Never. And whatever has got you so afraid of death, the day it gets to be your love that is the weapon or your love for someone, you can't touch them, you can't hold them, you can't squeeze them, you got to stay away from them. There is absolutely no way that could be spiritually grounded in truth. There is no way love could be doing as the power that's happening to us now. That is divinely impossible. 